Remember, this is a word-for-word, -word, verse by verse Bible study. So the goal of this is that you understand every single word in the Bible. Some people have a hard time understanding the Bible, so that's why I strongly recommend watching our verse by verse Bible studies because I literally explain every word. And once you get the gist down as you keep listening for hours, then pretty soon the rest of the Bible will become easy to understand. All right, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. We'll go to verse 5 now. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. So notice that there is a class of people called servants that God commands them to obey to those that are their masters. Now, some people are wondering what kind of masters these are. Could they be spiritual? No, these are literal masters. Notice it says, according to the flesh. So these are flesh and blood masters. So yes, there was slavery back in the old days. That went on for the majority of human history, actually. If you keep reading, it says, with fear and trembling, uh, with, the, with fear and trembling. So the Bible says that when you obey these masters, you have to do it with fear and you have to do it with trembling. It also says in singleness of your heart. So there has to be a unity of your heart, not like a double mindedness to thinkings here, like one of bitterness and then you obey him at the same time. No, actually it should be with your whole heart in singleness, like I want to obey as unto Christ. Notice that this obedience is surrendered to Jesus Christ when you obey him. Why? Because the idea is this, when God tells you to obey somebody, then it's obeying God as well. We saw that with children obeying parents, wives submitting to husbands. And that was this, and that's the same thing with the slaves to their masters. Now, some people might think that this is referring to a hired class, but that's not actually true. This is not where we get like butlers or a hired class of people today. Although at times it can apply to that, we do know in this passage it's not. You might say, how do we know that? It's very simple because of context. If you read the, if you keep reading down, it says at verse 8, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So notice here that this is referring to slavery. Now, this and other passages in your Bible are used by critics to show that, well, see, you know, God, he actually uh, condones slavery over there. But no, that's not true. Uh, if you look at the Old Testament, it's very, very infamous concerning about slavery. Where some atheists, they'll claim, well, didn't you know that in the Old Testament that God says that you can uh, sell your child to be sold as a slave? And then people get baffled by that. So then how do you answer that? Well, the answer is actually more simple than you think. You might say, really? Yeah, because number one, you have to understand the culture of that time. I think that's what people don't understand. They don't understand about the culture of that time. The culture of that time, if people actually really dig into it, is that slavery was the norm. You might say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, here's the thing is that if you put your cultural norms of today, especially with the legalization of what you're smoking and then the marriages that you're legalizing, if you enforced it uh, during that time, then they would actually say the same thing about you. They would actually say, well, I don't agree with that. So what's the point here? The point is, which people don't understand, the point is that God, he's not the type that forces people away from what is the norm of their culture that time. A good example is polygamy. God allowed that during the old time. But actually God, for some of you who don't know this, God actually did not want polygamy during that time. He wanted it to just be uh, one man and one woman. But uh, some people... They think that, oh, well, God, he allowed polygamy. He commanded polygamy. No, that's not the case. The case is, is that because mankind wanted it. The mankind, they said that, if you look at what Jesus said when he was talking with his disciples, that it was originally one man, one woman, the disciples were saying, well, then it's good not to marry at all if we can't 
just if we can't divorce whenever we want to. <laughs> because uh, they had a polygamy of wives so they can choose whoever they wanted. So that was the norm of that time. But in our timeline, we would think that you're a male chauvinist or something like that. You're a horrible man. Imagine, wives, that your husband did that to you. <laughs> Be a reign of terror, so to speak, perhaps. So the idea is this. The idea is is you have to think about what's the cultural norm of that time. And God, because he's such a, it should actually magnify his grace rather than how mean God is. See, some people think that when God had slavery that time or polygamy or other things like stoning to death and other norms, cultural norms of that timeline, when God mentioned about those things, some people think that God is being too hard, but actually it's the opposite. God is extremely gracious. Why? Because the, that was the norm of the people that time. And if God changed that and said, no, I want it to be something different, then they would have collapsed. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about uh, the norm of this time is basically it's normal for you to take God's name in vain and to say the F word. That's normal for you guys. And you have no single guilty conscience about it. Shame on you. But during the, that time of the children of Israel, if you took God's name in vain, the norm was stoning you to death. See that? So thank God that we're not going through that process today of stoning to death. Why? Because that's an example of God's grace to you to allow you with your cultural norm of this time. So you got to realize that actually what God allows mankind to do, like saying the stupid F word, and people where they had divorce of women just like that at the Old Testament, or slavery and etc., you got to realize that that's not actually the meanness of God, but rather His grace and mercy. He's allowing people to do that because if He changed it, then it would have ruined all of the entirety of structure and society and it would have been too much for those people to bear. I mean, that's what the disciples said when Jesus told them that it was originally one man, one woman. That's not supposed to be divorcing whoever you want and have a polygamy of wives. And the disciples says, this is just too much for us to bear. <laughs> See, so people don't understand that. So you got to realize that when God talks about certain things in the Bible, that was the norm of that time. Now, returning to the passage, another thing is this, is that go to Romans chapter 13, Romans 13. So then God understanding that this was the normal practice of that time where they had slavery, then God realized if that's gonna be your norm that you have to practice in your society, then what is important to understand is that you have to have a good practice of where the servant is acting submissive and obedient to the leader and the leader has to be uh, the leader has to be compassionate and not abusive to the servant that principle applies notice that principle applies with children submitting to the parent and the parent as a leader not being abusive but compassionate and understanding with the children. Same thing with the wives, with obeying and submitting to the husband, and the husband as a leader, making sure to showing uh, loving the wife as much as he would love his own body, not abusing his authority. And that's the same thing with today's principle, with people submitting to the government leaders. That thing never changed. And government powers is even worse than a status sometimes of a husband being a leader, a parent being a leader, uh, or the master being the leader. Sometimes the government can be worse. You might say, why? Because government is always corrupt in every historical timeline. Masters, husbands, and uh, parents, you'll get uh, a large amount of good people, and there are those abusive bad ones too, but a large amount of them you'll get good people too. But in government... Nearly every government, about 99% of your government throughout all of history is always corrupt. And God says, see, even with corrupt leaders, we as servant status, so to speak, or people obeying the leader status, we have to submit to the authority. So the idea is this. The idea is not about 
slavery or men abusing wives because I'm the one in charge or children not having an in, uh, children not being able to grow and become more mature because they have to obey their parents. It's not a see this is what society is teaching us. They're stretching so much to the class of freedom that basically it's what they're deceiving you is it's not freedom, it's rebellion. God, what he's thinking about is he's not thinking about slave status or uh, women being abused in all of Ephesians 5 and 6. What he's simply thinking about is obedience to leadership and authorities. Those who have authoritative positions, God does not want to see rebellion. See, that's the idea because it is a sin. If there is a society, if society is set or uh, God sets up a principle in the Bible where a person has an authoritative position, God expects obedience, not rebellion. See, that's the whole idea. Do you understand? Go to Romans chapter 13. Look at this. <clears throat> Verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Uh, notice verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. And not only that, we have to give uh, fear and tribute. Just like the servant does to the master at Ephesians 6. Look at verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. See that? So notice that there is no difference right here with the citizens submitting to the government with Ephesians chapter 6 where the servant has to submit to the master. Now, going back to these facts then brings up this question. The big question is, well, what, are, what about an example, Pastor, like the American Revolutionary War? Were we wrong? So that is a hard question to ask. So then the idea is this, because we, especially during the times where we're hitting with the coronavirus situation, there's a lot of Christians and churches who are really going for the anarchist route, see? Rush Limbaugh, he had to disable a lot of his accounts because he was saying that you know, those people back at the American Revolutionary War, I'm glad they did not uh, submit to the government. I'm glad that they spoke out and they spoke out against the taxes and then they dumped the tea off the ships and they uh, raised up a rebellion. We should do the same thing too. And you remember that riot that they had at Cap Capitol Hill? So because uh, Limbaugh was basically where it appeared as he was condoning a riot, he had to condone all of the social media accounts. So see, it becomes a really abstract line now where, okay, then at to what point then? Up to what point? Is it, were we wrong in rebelling? So the simple answer, which is actually not a simple answer, but it is a simple answer when you take it with simplicity, is I don't know. That's the best position. Because uh, there are Bible-believing preachers who say that the American Revolutionary War that uh, we were right for doing so, and that there were Baptist preachers who were involved in that. And then there are other people who would say that, uh, no, they were wrong, that you, uh, they should have obeyed the government, actually. So there is a mingled opinions amongst Bible believers. And me, the safest opinion is to always say, I don't know. And why? Because I'm not at the American Revolutionary War timeline, so I don't have to worry about that. But I am in this timeline, and I know from my spiritual conviction what's right. So the idea is this, is that in order to tell uh, uh, who was right and who's wrong, it's the same chapter, Romans 13. Romans 13, for some people who didn't notice that. It's actually in the same place. All right, so if you look at Romans 13, <clears throat> When the Bible talks about submitting to the government, notice when we keep reading down at verse 8, Oh, no man anything. Now remember, verse 7 is submitting to the government, the powers that be. 
The very next verse says, Owe no man anything, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, did you see that? That's the key there. So notice that God says, Owe no man anything. So in other words, uh, make sure that you don't go in debt. Pay your taxes. Submit to the government. But the next line, he says, you ha the idea is we're thinking about loving one another. Why is it that we have to submit to the government? Because we love people. We love one another. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Because realize this government and structure is set up for the people. It's to have an organized society, not chaos all over. You have to have rules. I mean, no matter how much of an anarchist you are, you do have rules. <laughs> you do have principles. Even gangs and criminals have rules and codes. Didn't you know that? Yeah. So the idea is this, is that <clears throat> the idea is, is that if you care for your society, you love the people. That's the reason why submission to the government is in principle. But the idea is this, is that the next part it says, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Do you see that? You're not a lawbreaker when you're thinking about other people and you love them. Did you hear what I say? You're not a lawbreaker when you're thinking about other people and you love them. So the idea is this. So I'm not saying I condone the Revolutionary War, but to share the side of the people of the Bible believers who condone the American Revolutionary War, the idea is this, those guys weren't lawbreakers. You might say, how so? The reason why is because they were thinking about the principle of loving the people, loving one another. So that when you're thinking about people, what's best for them, and you love them, you know that, hey, it's because of that I have to follow the government, even though they're corrupt in some things, and submit to its authority. Why? Because I burden the people. Or it can go the other way. Well, because my family is in jeopardy. We're in heavy taxation. My people are being persecuted by brutal British soldiers, etc. A Baptist preacher was, I believe, uh, uh, killed, murdered because of the British soldiers. So because I love my fellow Christians who are being basically, I guess, persecuted by these uh, Britons, I am going to join in the American Revolutionary War. See that? Here's another example. Another example is even if you're submitting to the government, here's a great abstract example, okay? Let's say we're submitting to the powers that be. We don't get involved in a rebellion or in a war, and they even persecuted Christians, and we're not involved in a war at all, in a revolutionary war. We're willing to lay down our lives for Jesus Christ, be persecuted, etc. But let's say that even at that point, they were to grab your wife and your children, okay, in your home. And then these soldiers brutally beat your wife and your children. And then they did, God forbid, they sexually assaulted them, etc. What are you going to do as a man? Submit to their authority or you're actually going to take out a gun or maybe even fight back? See that? So even in a very abstract point, let's say that happens to me. I submit to the powers that be, okay? And I'm willing to be persecuted for Jesus, etc. And then they arrest me, etc. But at some point, I'm going to break. Because when these soldiers come inside my house, I, uh, I get arrested. My wife and children get arrested. But all of a sudden, they start to beat up on my kids and my wife and maybe even sexually assault them. You think I'm just going to sit down like a good boy or you think I'm going to get up and beat them? See that? So you got to understand this. That's why God never set a, uh, a, a fine line on how much you can submit and how much to rebel. God simply sees it as at verse 8. That is crucial key. If you love one another, if you love people, you fulfill the law. You're not a lawbreaker. So then why would I submit to the government today, for example, right? Why would I get involved in a revolutionary war? And some onliners might get upset at me and they say, why don't you get involved at the Capitol riot? Why are you condemning those people for doing that? The reason why is this is because I'm not just thinking about myself. Everyone, when they get involved in a war or revolution, they're only thinking about their rights. My rights, my rights, my rights, my rights. But you don't think about people. 
Because uh, am I willing? You got to realize this. Just If I get involved in a stupid riot like that, is that worth the sacrifice of losing the ministry of my people in San Francisco Bay Area because of one riot that I got involved in? Because of just one. And not only that, it wasn't even worth it too. They squelched me out. Is it worth it where onliners, you don't hear Bible-believing truth anymore? How many of you got saved? How many of you heard about Bible-believing truth? Because we're still on. You know why? Because I didn't get involved many years ago in something stupid where it would arrest me or I would, uh, where I would get arrested or I'd lose my ministry just because I get involved in some kind of riot or something like that. So some of you onliners can be very, very critical towards me saying, you're such a compromiser, Pastor. Why won't you go out and why won't you speak out? Well, then uh, why, why are you watching me and why, how did you get saved? How did you hear about Bible-believing truth? That's very ungrateful of you. It's because I did what was right because I cared about your soul, about people's soul. The only time that I cannot submit, remember, that's the same principle in any leadership position and any submissive role. The only time you don't submit is what? When they make you sin, when it violates scripture. But when it doesn't do that, you submit as much as you can because why? That's scriptural principle. That's the idea. Okay, going back, going back, Ephesians chapter six. So I hope that was extremely helpful. So you trust me, you wanna know this because the times are gonna get a little bit worse. In our day and age. It's going to get worse. All right, let's look at verse 6. Now we're going to look at uh, verse 6. The Bible says, not with eye service. So then those servants, they're not supposed to just uh, please the masters where, hey, look at me. You see what I'm doing? No, then uh, you're a people pleaser then. Yeah, you're a people pleaser. You're basically a lap dog, actually. I mean, the Bible did say to submit, but the Bible never said to intend it to be like a lap dog, like, hey, look at me, am I not a good guy? And sometimes you might be doing it hypocritically too. You don't mean it. All right, continuing reading on, the Bible says you don't do it where the masters uh, get pleased by seeing you as men pleasers. We don't do it to please men, but as the servants of Christ. That's the idea. So then these slaves during that timeline, they were supposed to obey the masters. Why? Because they were thinking about, I'm doing it for the Lord, not for him. Because there are masters who are unsaved people as well. You know, actually, it's a huge blessing where the servants were able to lead their masters to salvation. You might say, give me an example. A great example is the Syrian general at the Old Testament. There was a Jewish slave girl. She was captured from her homeland in a pagan land. But because she was a proper uh, slave girl, and then she abided by biblical principle and was a good testimony, she was able to lead her master to salvation. And her master was a high-class general in the pagan army. See, that's a great example. So, uh, obviously, it's not like there's slavery today, but... We can consider this in a spiritual application where there is a servant class and a leadership class, so to speak. So whether you're a person as an inmate in prison or a worker in a business job or even a butler serving uh, the man or the woman of the house, the point is, is that if you have a, some kind of servant class position, you don't want to do it where you try to serve them gaining their attention or to please people. You're doing it for Jesus Christ. So that's a great example for all of you who are working in jobs to do it because of Jesus Christ. Not to please your boss and then get a higher pay, right? Doing the will of God from the heart. So that's the whole idea. All of it is from the heart. All of it has to be done from the heart. Uh, go to the book of Colossians, please. Go to the book of Colossians. Some people don't understand that when we serve the Lord, we have to do it in a way where all of our heart is put into it. We can't just do it because it's just tradition or because we just do it. The idea is, is when we serve the Lord and when we do things for him, 
All of our heart and mind has to be put into it. Uh, look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 3, <laughs> chapter 3, and uh, verse 17, please. Notice that the Bible reads, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, so whatever you say and whatever you do, God says, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So notice that it's doing it for God. It's doing it accordingly to his name. Uh, look at verse 23. Verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. That's the idea. So when returning to Ephesians 6, if these servants, so I'm not just limit, limiting to slaves because we're not under slavery today. I'm applying it as a servant class in general because everyone has that kind of class and status yep. every one of you when you're serving your leader or quote unquote your master so to speak you got to realize it's not done for them or to gain their att attention and that's what people do for money 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 you got to do it because i'm doing it for god that's what you got to do uh, even students when you're studying in school you got to realize you're not doing it to please your professor you're doing it uh, for the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord. And then you just trust God with whatever grade or score you get out at the end. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Let God be the one in charge of your internship, externship, your higher pay, your promotion, a good grade, right. your transfer to a better position, etc. Mm -hmm. Let God be the mind out of everything and don't do it to please people. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord. So that's why when you do that, then the Lord can bless it. So then these slaves during that timeline, they were rewarded and blessed by God when they have the same mentality like you people do today. Uh, let's look at verse 7. With goodwill doing service. That matches with our Colossians chapter 3. You have to do it with the right heart. Goodwill. Good intention. Not like grudgingly. Oh, I have to do it. Or you complain. You do it with goodwill. Uh, try doing that in your workplace. That's difficult, right? I could probably park it a little bit right there. Your boss can be a jerk and other people too. But you have to have good intention and you got to realize I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it for the Lord. Amen. That's the idea. Yeah. Slaves had to do it that timeline and they had it worse than you did back then. Notice over here at verse 7, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. And that's key. Now, this thus ends at Ephesians 5 all the way to Ephesians 6.6. 6. All the passage is all about submission. That's the key. So God, all he cares about in these passages is how much are you willing to submit to authority? Don't be rebellious. Uh, don't be a bad testimony. Make sure that you do it in a way where it's uh, pleasing to the Lord. That's the idea. So notice that Ephesians 5 and 6 violates today's uh, anarchist type of society. And if you don't believe that today's liberal-minded principles is full of anarchy, just look at Antifa. All right? That is anarchy. That, and you know how they talk? They talk, this is freedom. This is, as one stupid government leader said, summer of love. Yeah. See, that's the delusion. That is delusion. Yep. Delusion is when you have to get rid of authority. And that includes people who are against the liberal government today, too, who are so much into conspiracy theories. Both sides of the left and right wingers have a problem with submitting to authority. And we absolutely refuse to follow this kind of rebel generation because it is what the devil uses a rebel generation to raise up a bunch of rebels. And remember this, Satan always uses freedom to uh, disguise rebellion. Think about the communists. How did the communist governments come out? The communist governments, they came out because they fooled the people into thinking this is freedom. So finally, we get rid of our aristocratic leaders and we're all equality. Uh, wrong. The dictators use the equality excuse, the freedom excuse, put them in bondage. Think about the liberals' generation. Uh, a lot of people didn't know where uh, MLK, 
Uh, his name is actually not Martin Luther, but it's actually Michael uh, Luther King Jr. His real name is Michael. But him and then the other liberals who picked it off, Michael was actually tied to communists. You didn't know that, did you? They, weren't, uh, they didn't release the records until supposedly uh, last year. Last year, supposedly. So I don't know what happened to that because the virus may have changed things. But uh, he was with communist ties. Why? Because of that equality status that people were brainwashed into thinking. Then the liberal generation picked it off, deceiving people and minorities. This is all about equality status. But now you just push that, what you call freedom, but it's disguising rebellion and you push it more and more and more and more that it's gotten to a point of no return where at 2020, you're just justifying whatever riots and anarchy is coming out there. What's the point? The point is, is that when the Lord sets up authority, people don't like that. That's the bottom line, the bottom line. Now, did people suffer oppression and unfairness? Sure, but guess what we do too today still. That will never change, oppression and unfairness. That never changes. So it's not to justify abusive, authoritative positions. There were aristocratic leaders before the communist leaders who were abusive, who were uh, dictatorial in their authorities, tyrannical, etc. We get that. But guess what? Uh, it will always remain in every generation. When people have a position of power, they get drunk on it and they carry that power further. That will never change. So what you got to understand is what God is looking at the root cause the root cause is man in his innate nature has a rebellious attraction right. a rebellious attraction right. even look think about it get rid of all abuse in authoritative positions all right will that get rid of your rebellious nature within you nope. it will never it will never whether you get rid of authority or you have authority nothing's gonna change we will have rebellion forever that's why God realizes that submission is important. One important thing is this, all right? This is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll go to the next part. Because I'm parking on this because it's very important. Because when I look at history, this has always been our problem, is rebellion. That's why Genesis 6 happened. Genesis 6, no government that time. Uh, they had a rebellious nature. Imagination of the heart was only evil continually. So God had to drown them out with the flood and then they finally had some sort of human government. But that didn't help either. The last thing that I want to say is this, is that the Lord is really going to try and test your submission by uh, putting leaders who might be unfair or who might have problems. Right. That would be good preaching. You might say, why is that good, Pastor? Because trust me, one day, okay, a lot of people attend Bible-believing churches all happy and all joyous, but they see some flaw with a Bible-believing pastor because no pastor is perfect, including your pastor here. And then when you have that, your expectation comes down, and then you backslide, you don't go to church, and then you're all by yourself in the flesh. That's why, because we have this mindset of... We, that I can only submit when the leader is perfect. In an ideal, perfect world, then I can follow the rules. But guess what? That's, that's fantasy. No leader is perfect. Only Jesus Christ. Why do you think that at uh, verse 5, 6, and then when God was speaking to the women to submit to husband, at 29 to 33 children to the parents, why did God say that it's submitting to the Lord, not to men? Because he knows mankind is imperfect, sinful. So he says, when you obey, remember this, just look at me as your perfect leader. Okay, this is going to be helpful because times are going to get worse. <laughs> times are going to get worse. And I hope that especially onlineers remember what I taught today. That way in the future, the devil don't take your rebellious nature streak and ruin your lives. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth. So any good thing that you do, the same shall receive of the Lord. You're going to get your reward from the Lord. Remember, that was Colossians 3. We read that passage. You get an inheritance from God. Whether he be bond or free. So whether you're bond or whether you're free, the point is whatever good thing you do, God takes account and he rewards it. 
Now, obviously, this does not, uh, God does not allow masters to become abusive in their position. Same thing with husbands not being abusive or parents being abusive. So then the Lord says at verse 9, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening. So God's saying that the masters, they have to do good will, good intention to the slaves too of that timeline. Forbearing threatening. So God says that uh, threat, threatening slaves is actually wrong. They have to forbear it. They have to withhold it. Knowing that your master also is in heaven. That's scary. Why? Because they've, they've got a master up in heaven, and if he threatens you when you actually deserve the threatening, <laughs> you and I would have been shot to hell a long time ago. Right. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Now that's an important line that God mentioned to the masters. God is saying that with individuals, God doesn't take respect. Like, oh, the masters have a better position than the servants. To God's eyes, every individual is a child of God to him. So he says over here that uh, how well I treat the slave is the same thing how well I would treat the master. So then uh, that was the problem with the masters of that timeline. And then no wonder that the people had a rebellious, uh, they had to rebel against the masters. No wonder people during the American Revolutionary War had to rebel against the government. And then even today, today, Children and wives rebel against the leadership and authority. Why? Because of abusive positions. Remember I told you about that hippie generation? I know they're rebels and they're in the wrong. They're totally in the wrong. But they did have a legitimate reason. Their parents were people who did not raise their children right. They took, uh, abuse, uh, they took an abusive authority, so to speak. They weren't compassionate, loving parents. You know, if you have a leader who's so compassionate and loving towards you, you'd listen to them more. You'd follow to them more. So that's why it's important that uh, leaders don't abuse their positions. No wonder we're in a messed up generation. So don't. Uh, so here's something that I have to say, actually. You really can't blame. Some people might get upset at me, but it's true. You can't really blame the BLM rioters. You might say, oh, pastor. No, no, you really can't blame them. Because they're trying to find any excuse out there of some kind of white man somewhere where they were oppressive. And just 10 white people is good enough for them, you got to realize. Now, it doesn't give them legitimate reason for what they do, but it still doesn't change the fact that, it, look, if they couldn't find any abuse to begin with, they don't have a good excuse. But they're digging anywhere for anything that's abusive out there to justify their reasons for rebellion. So guess what? Don't give the world an excuse. Don't give your children an excuse to rebel. Don't give your wife an excuse to rebel. Leaders, when you have a leadership position, don't give the people who are serving you uh, an excuse to rebel. Never do that. So I know that this is talking about slaves and masters at verse 5 and 9, but we definitely can take a lot of spiritual application over here. Basically, is that if you're at a serving position, and then if you're at a leadership position, then you got to realize that uh, the leaders should take their authority, their position very seriously and can't blame the people who are serving them uh, if they rebel, if they abuse their authority. God forbid this pastor does it. Uh, a lot of IFB pastors, independent fundamental Baptist pastors, have that problem. They have that major problem. Because why? They're thinking about building an empire and controlling everybody. And then guess what? The Lord judged them severely. So we have to look at this passage. Look at James. Look at the book of James. Now look, a master position is not fun. You might think that, oh, it's unfair that they can say and do whatever they want. But no, it's not what you think. Look at the book of James. And then we'll look at uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. James chapter 3. And then uh, we'll read verse 1. Notice that uh, the Bible reads that we are not supposed to take too much owe to joy about our master class position and take it very lightly. Verse 1 says, My brethren, be not many masters, 
knowing that we shall receive the what? Greater condemnation. Masters receive a worse uh, condemnation than the servant when they mess up. You might say, why? Because they're a leadership authority. Well, then, pastor, are you saying that me as a husband gets it worse than the wife? Yeah. <laughs> Do pastors get it worse than the members? Yeah. Do um, uh, parents get it worse than the children? Yeah. You think that you can abuse your power after that? Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. See, the Lord, uh, when he sets up a structure... Even the worst type where people might think today about slavery, one, God tries to meet it that's comfortable to the norm of that timeline. That shows his grace. And the second thing that manifests his grace is that he makes sure that everybody is treated rightly. He rebukes both the leader and the person who is under submission. So God is never unfair. Remember that. We're going to look at verse 10 now. Now, this is the key passage that you want to know. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, verses 10 through 18 is about spiritual Christian warfare that you must know about. The Bible says that Ephesians chapter 6 and then verse 10, finally, my brethren, so Paul says finally, so why did he say finally? Because... He just went on a spiel like I did about submission, 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 submission at chapter 5 and chapter 6. And then he went also on a long time talking about uh, kicking against sin at chapter 4 and chapter 3, uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5. And then the latter, the middle of chapter 5, he talked about giving thanks, being filled with the Spirit, singing psalms. And then Paul, Paul is basically giving a long sermon. A very long sermon. Uh, Ephesians, I mean, I'm telling you, Ephesians starting at chapter 4 all the way through 6 is a great sermon. It's a great sermon. It has everything that you can talk about a sermon there. So Ephesians 4 through 6. Ephesians, uh, let's see, Ephesians 1 through 3 is about the results of your salvation and the dispensation that Paul received. And then he, the latter part of Ephesians chapter 6 is spiritual warfare. That's a great thing. Ephesians is such a great book. It has, it's a mixture of doctrinal, pa practical, and uh, devotional, and all applying to the Christian. All applying to the Christian. Great passage. All right. Now, uh, verse 10. You know, spiritual warfare will probably, probably be the most important chapter, uh, more, most important topic of all of Ephesians probably. All right. My throat was hurting, so I apologize. I had to do that. All right. Verse 10. Finally, so Paul finally wraps up his long message of rebuking sin and telling them what to do. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So Paul says that the Christian, that they should be strong in the Lord. So it's in the Lord that you are strong, and it's also done at the power of his might. Go to the book of ooh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. So that's self-explanatory, right? you got to be strong, but it's in God that you find your strength. Notice that you have to be in power, but that power is found in his might. Not your might. Strong and power. And that is all found through the Lord himself. Okay. Reading on. Philippians chapter 3. Notice that we cannot, we cannot have confidence in the flesh. That is so important. When you're fighting the devil, when you're fighting demons, don't ever do it of your own ability. Don't do it by your own planning, no matter how good your plan is. Don't say, well, I'll just keep pushing. No, you can't do that. Then you will fall and you will die and you will give up. And you will get depressed and you will think that God has given you a burden and a battle greater than you can bear. 
Of course you think that way because you're doing it in your own strength. Look at verse four, uh, verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and what? Have no confidence in the flesh. Notice that. So God's, uh, we, uh, notice that the Bible says we have to do it in the Spirit, in Christ Jesus. Don't be confident in your flesh. All right, go back to Ephesians 6. Never do that, church. That's the reason why so many, uh, I can even tell you this, a lot of pastors fell away. You might say, why? Because they had confidence in their flesh. Look what I did. My empire that I built. All the souls I led to Christ. The sermons that I preached. I get so many altar calls all the time. And that's very dangerous when you get that way. You got to watch out for that. <coughs> uh, look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So notice that it says you have to stand. You have to stand against. Now, combining with verse 10, that where it says, be strong in the Lord, that's a command. It's not an option. Go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2. All right, now, this is something that you know, but you really don't know. All right? Now, was that too deep for you, or did you get that? This is something that you know, or you should know, but you just don't really know, and you just don't get it in your mind. You might say, what do you mean, Pastor? What I mean is this. Um, you live in a very spoiled generation. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know, I think that the context flows beautifully. It ties with the previous verses that we talked about, about our rebellious nature, not being submissive. Because the idea is, is the, why is it that we have this nature that wants to keep rebelling and uh, notice the younger generation and younger generation get even more spoiled. And we wonder, why are they so spoiled? It's because of that lack of authority and submission to follow orders. See that? We want to go by rebellious nature, how we want to do things. When that happens, the sensitivity increases. The sensitivity increases where we get offended more easily. A person who's used to following orders, they don't have that kind of mentality. A person, if you're in the military, if you've been in the military before, and you're used to following orders back in the old days and just obeying just at once and stuff like that, they don't get like hypersensitive. They don't like whine about the silliest things. Drop down and give me 20. Oh, why do I have to do that, you know? They don't become like that or, oh, this is so hard. And No, they don't do that. Now they are. They're trying to make them do that, you know? It's so ridiculous. But the idea is this. Why do people have that nature? Because they're used to be given a handout. They're used to being given a handout. Person following orders, they're used to trial, pain, and even leaders who mess up anyways. They're used to that, yet they're thinking about what's right and what's following orders. And they don't get spoiled as much easily. So because we live in a rebellious nature, that will lead to weakness in warfare. And that's what the devil is looking at. So we think that when we... Now, this is going to be hard for some of you. Now, we don't take your suffering, your burden lightly. Amen? Amen. Uh, the Bible says, bury one another's burdens. And we talked about that even in Ephesians 2, that there's a limit to that one. But you've got to realize this, is that quite often, the reason why you're feeling so burdened is because you don't take it as the norm in life. You're so used to, America is so free. I'm independent. I deserve to be spoiled. I deserve my rights, and et cetera, et cetera. So because of that, when some kind of pain or catastrophe happens, then what happens? Then you whine, you complain, you think life is too difficult and hard. Talk about, uh, you talk about the slaves at the Dark Ages. You think that uh, they, they had the mentality like you, or they knew that, look, this is the norm in life. <laughs> Man, it was a nightmare during... You heard about the history of the Dark Ages from my lesson. Yeah. That was the norm that time. That some Viking would just come inside your home and your family and you have to run for your lives. Right. My goodness, we're at a sissified generation today. We're always whining about something. Always being weak. 
Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse <clears throat> 1. Thou therefore, my son, be what? Strong. Strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Did you see that? Now, what people don't understand, go to 2 Timothy 4 now, 2 Timothy 4, and we're going to have to wrap it up here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is what we see as the spirit world. In this spirit world, we are facing forces and energy and powers of darkness. This is the world that you're walking in. It's not a beautiful world. It's a world of darkness and spiritual powers. You know what you think that your life is? You think your life, this is your problem, is America, what you see in TV advertisements and what Hollywood displays on stupid television and what you mess up around in video games. Uh, okay. And as every younger generation wants a higher quality pick, then their generation, their mentality of a beautiful world gets even more spoiled. Yeah. Now, this is your problem. This is, okay, your world is not happiness, you know. This is a world of doom and gloom, sorry. Now, I don't, I don't know if I shattered your world and you don't want to come to our church anymore after that. But it's actually a world of doom and gloom. It's a world of darkness. It's a world where pain has to happen. Where Satan has to attack you. Where the powers that be have to tempt you. Where you're at warfare 24-7. Why are you thinking about a beautiful house and then a nice family and then a church where we can all get along and then a job with the good pay? You're in a fantasy, man. Now look, God can give you those things. And there is great joy in the Christian life. Amen? But see, you're so lost in that that you think that that is the greater world in the world you're living in is happiness and positivity. No wonder people love Joel Osteen. Wow, yeah. That's the world that he's offering to them, a TV generation mindset. Right, right. You got to realize the world that we're living in is evil, it's wicked, and it's hard. So it's expected that as soon as you get up in the morning, you grit your teeth, drag yourself to pray on your knees, read the Bible, go to job, be a good testimony. People treat you unfairly in work. Go to church and things bad happen in your church or something messes up in your home. That's normal. Yeah. Amen. Wow, you're being strong, Pastor. Yeah, because you know what I'm doing? You're in boot camp right now and you need to get yelled at a little bit because... And some onliners said, why do you yell? You don't have to yell. See, that's the kind of a mindset generation we live in. Yep. Army, it's normal that they yell at you. Why? Because they're trying to get that pansy streak off of you. Mm -hmm. You're not used to that. You're used to that Siri voice, which is a female voice. Yeah. Siri female voice that sounds so calm and tender that when she's giving you orders, you go, oh, Siri, yes, I'll make a left turn for you. <laughs> That's the generation we live in, man. That's the generation we live in. It's expected that you have to sweat for God. You have to shed blood for Him. That's normal. So when you get up in the morning, don't have an excuse not to come to church, not to read your Bible, not to conquer the sin, because it's too hard. What did you expect? It's supposed to be hard. If you realize that to begin with, it's hard, then that means you have no excuse then. You think that because it's hard, you have a legitimate excuse? That's not a legitimate excuse. It's supposed to be hard. Did you read the verse? Thou therefore endure hardness. Yeah, yes. Look at chapter 4 and verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. See, yeah, that's how you should live till the end. There's no, there's no end in the middle of your life to this battle, this warfare. Just because the Lord delivered you from one problem and one suffering, that doesn't mean it ends. There's another one coming. There's a hundred more coming. You got to realize that. When does it end, Pastor? It will never end. It, yeah, it doesn't end till the day you die. That's Christian warfare. Until we die and go to heaven, that's where we get it. 
So if you realize about Christian warfare, then you will understand about battling things in life. You have to be strong, okay? All right, let's end it here. So we're going a little bit over the time now, so let's close it off here. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings are a blessing and a help to the hearers. I had to preach a lot against something within our flesh, Lord. There's something within our flesh that I had to preach against so that we can be able to not be spoiled like this generation, but be the way that you want us to be, scripturally minded, biblically principled, to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.